Let us pray. Almighty God, look with loving mercy on your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed, to be given over to the hands of sinners, and to suffer death on the cross, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. The first reading is from Isaiah chapter 53, beginning at the fourth verse. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent. So he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice, he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich. Although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear the, their iniquities. Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Word of God, word of life. Be God. The second reading is from Revelation chapter 5, beginning at the first verse. Then I saw in the right hand of the one seated on the throne a scroll written on the inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep bitterly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, a lamb standing as if it had been slaughtered, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of the one who was seated on the throne. When he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense which are the prayers of the saints. They sing a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slaughtered, and by your blood you, ran you ransomed for God saints from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests serving our God, and they will reign on earth. 
Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels surrounding the throne and the living creatures and the elders. They numbered myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, singing with full voice, worthy is the lamb that was slaughtered to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Word of God, word of life. Mercy and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. Both of those readings that you just heard use the image of a lamb, but they use them in very different ways. The first reading from Isaiah describes God's suffering servant. And Christians have long interpreted that description of the suffering servant to be the Messiah. Isaiah describes him thus, like a lamb led to the slaughter, he didn't complain, though he was wounded for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. The Revelation reading, on the other hand, describes that lion of Judah, powerful and conquering. But then John of Patmos, the author of Revelation, flips the script to describe that powerful figure who's conquered as a lamb and not some big, majestic, like, powerful, bighorn sheep, but a little baby lamb who was slaughtered. The thing is, both of those images of the Messiah, both of those images of Jesus are true. Jesus is the Lamb of God. He was slain for us. But that suffering and death weren't just violence for their own sake. They weren't some exercise in needless brutality, in torture and suffering. Because God worked through the cross. God worked through that violence and pain and suffering that Jesus felt and transformed them so that they'd become not just a hopeless sign of pain and loss, but a mark of redemption and life and hope. In a few minutes, we'll hear the Passion Gospel as St. John records it. And there's two things that I want to point out about this, this Passion Gospel. The first is that John makes a lot of references to the Jews. John was himself a member of a Jewish community which had been in conflict with its... With, John and the members of his community had been in conflict with their friends and relatives and family members in some cases because they had accepted Jesus as the Messiah. There was a lot of tension in the earliest days of the church between Jews who were Christians and Jews who weren't. And it was out of that conflict and out of that struggle that John was writing his gospel. And it's out of that conflict and struggle that John's portrayal of the Jews was written. St. John's words are describing one specific group of Jewish authorities in the first century and should not be used the way that Christians have used them for centuries. To slander and use as an excuse for violence against Jewish people in all times and all places. That's not what St. John was or should have been getting at. The other thing to point out about John's Passion Gospel is the way that St. John describes Jesus' crucifixion. He's calm and confident and in control. The way that St. John portrays Jesus, he's doing exactly what he's supposed to be doing. Uncomplaining in his suffering because he knows that through his crucifixion, even death itself will be transformed and redeemed. That God's will and God's work will be done. Because that Lamb of God who suffers and who goes like a sheep led to the slaughter, 
that same Lamb of God is the Lamb of God who has triumphed and who is worthy and who has redeemed us all. The passion story that we're about to hear is the story of the culmination of God's work. It's the story not just of Jesus, the Lamb of God, suffering for our sins, but also of that Lamb who was slain, of that Lamb facing all of the evil and pain and hurt and violence and death that the world could bring to bear, and of that lamb who was slain, emerging victorious and triumphant through the work of God on the cross. Amen. be seated. Our first reading comes from the book of John, the 18th chapter. 
Jesus went out with the disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place to a place where, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now, Jesus, who betrayed him, also knew the place, because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees. And they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus, Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing, standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again, he asked them, Whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you are looking, looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom he gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, put your sword back into its sheath, and I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better not to have one person die for the people. Our second reading continues from the 18th chapter of John. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the woman who guarded the gate and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, you are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter was also standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. And when he said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face saying, is that how you answer the high priest? And Jesus answered, if I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself, and they asked him, You're not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. I am one of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, and asked, 
Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it, and at that moment, the cock crowed. of John. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, 
What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answer, answered, do you ask this of your own or do others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priest have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, so are you a king? Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asks him, what is truth? After he said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Fourth reading, John 19th chapter. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged, and the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, here's the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, we have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he has claimed to be the son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid of them afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus came, gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, you would have no power over me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, if greater sin, if you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at the place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, here is your king. They cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate asked them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, we have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified.
Fifth reading continues at the 17th verse of John 19. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write the King of the Jews, but this man said, I am King of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They took his clothes, they also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says, they divided my clothes among themselves and for my clothing they cast lots, and that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his own home.
After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath day was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified, so that you also may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, 
though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Jesus died to set us free from the sins of life and ourselves. His death was our death, and his resurrection is surely our resurrection.
please kneel or assume another posture of reverence. Let us pray, brothers and sisters, for the Holy Church throughout the world. Almighty and eternal God, you have shown your glory to all nations in Jesus Christ. By your Holy Spirit, guide the church and gather it throughout the world. Help your church to persevere in faith, proclaim your name, and bring the good news of salvation in Christ to all people. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for Elizabeth and Patricia, our bishops, for our pastors and deacons, and all servants of the church, and for all the people of God. Almighty and eternal God, your spirit guides the church and makes it holy. Strengthen and uphold our bishops, pastors, other ministers, and lay leaders. Keep them in health and safety for the good of the church, and help each of us in our various vocations to do faithfully the work to which you have called us. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us prepare... Let us pray for those preparing for baptism. Almighty and eternal God, you continue to bless the church. Increase the faith and understanding of those preparing for baptism. Give them new birth as your children and keep them in the faith and communion of your holy church. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for our sisters and brothers who share our faith in Jesus Christ. Almighty and eternal God, you give your church unity. Look with favor on all who follow Jesus, your Son. Make all the baptized ones in the fullness of faith and keep us united in the fellowship of love. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for the Jewish people, the first to hear the word of God.
Almighty and eternal God, long ago you gave your promise to Abraham and your teaching to Moses. Hear our prayers that the people you called and elected as your own may receive the fulfillment of the covenant's promises. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for those who do not share our faith in Jesus Christ. Almighty and eternal God, gather into your embrace all those who call out to you under different names. Bring an end to interreligious strife and make us more faithful witnesses of the love made known to us in your Son. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for those who do not believe in God. Almighty and eternal God, you created humanity so that all may long to know you and find peace in you. Grant that all may recognize the signs of your love and grace in the world and in the lives of Christians and gladly acknowledge you as the one true God. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for God's creation. Almighty and eternal God, you are the creator of a magnificent universe. Hold all the worlds in the arms of your care and bring all things to fulfillment in you. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for those who serve in public office. Almighty and eternal God, you are the champion of the poor and oppressed. In your goodness, give wisdom to those in authority, so that all people may enjoy justice, peace, freedom, and a share in the goodness of your creation. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for those in need.
Almighty and eternal God, you give strength to the weary and new courage to those who have lost heart. Heal the sick, comfort the dying, give safety to travelers, free those unjustly deprived of liberty, and deliver your world from falsehood, hunger, and disease. Hear the prayers of all who call on you in any trouble, that they may have the joy of receiving your help in their need. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Finally, let us pray for all those things for which our Lord would have us ask. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. Behold the life-giving cross on which was hung the salvation of the whole world. O come, let us worship him. Behold the life-giving cross, on which was hung the salvation of the entire world. O come, let us worship him. Behold the life-giving cross, on which was hung the salvation of the whole world. O come, let us worship him. Please stand as you're able.
We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. By your holy cross, you have redeemed the world. <laughs> 